So thank you all uh, so much for joining us. Uh, I'm a, uh, my name's Adam Good. I'm a senior strategist at Parsons TKO. I've been working with mission-driven organizations uh, on their digital uh, outreach and uh, communications and audience engagement uh, for over 12 years now, uh, working with nonprofits and mission-driven organizations, large and small. And something that uh, we're really passionate about at Parsons TKO is uh, the importance of contact models. Uh, so what we'll, we'll get into in this session is what is a contact model, um, why you need one and how to start creating it. Uh, in, a, in the course of a lot of our, our work in consulting, we, we come into uh, you know, situations where people wanna email more effectively or they wanna understand the visitors to their website or they, they wanna be able to, to interact with new audience members and understand their needs more. And particularly with so many different uh, tools in place and processes and bits of information that are likely scattered across your organization's uh, technical and personal ecosystem, uh, contact model becomes really critical if you want to be able to engage your audiences more effectively. So we're here to get you started uh, on, on that journey. Um, but first I'll zoom out a little bit and talk about our philosophy at Parsons CKO. Uh, on engagement. We call it engagement architecture, which is really thinking about holistically, what are the people and processes and platforms that empower your strategy, that drive engagement with your organizations, that create meaningful, trackable experiences uh, and interactions with your audiences. So that's why today, especially we're talking about the contact model and not a particular technical implementation of it um, because the people, the processes and the platforms all work together to help you better understand and interact with your audiences. Um, so we're gonna be talking about ways that you can start creating a contact model, get the various people and processes in your organization aligned and informed around it, and then make any necessary platform uh, adjustments, enhancements, replacements, uh, that will let you use that contact model to its to its fullest potential. So the obvious question, what is a contact model? I always like to start off my my webinars with a little bit of humor. So um, contact and model. I chose these because uh, Contact, great science fiction movie with, uh, with Jodie Foster, uh, where she receives uh, a signal, a sign uh, from extraterrestrial intelligence, and then has to figure out how to decode it and understand it, and then you know, leverage the world's resources to build uh, technologies that will allow her to, uh, or allow the world to interact with those, those new audience members. Um, so that you know the, the idea of making contact is is the point of your your contact model, uh, and model you know uh, Zoolander. The, we'll see him showing up throughout the webinar. Um, the idea of you have a clear picture uh, in your head of what it is that you're trying to do. So we'll be talking today about contact models. So the short definition is uh, that it's a mental model that outlines the key information that you need to know about specific contacts or groups of contacts uh, to power meaningful engagement. And I'll break this down uh, one step at a time. So the reason we start with mental model uh, is because from a technical standpoint, there are probably aspects of your contacts that are distributed across different platforms and technologies. So you probably have information about contacts in your email system. You probably have, uh, maybe you have a CRM that tracks similar information, but maybe it's different. You might also have a donation system and an event system, et cetera, et cetera. You probably also have a bunch of spreadsheets <laughs> that track various things uh, about your contacts. And so what uh, people try to do often is sort of say, oh, well, we need to update our CRM or we need to update our email list. Um, we like to start with the idea of the, the mental model for what you care to know about your contacts. Um, so that gets to the second point. What's the key information? You know, you, you've probably gone through uh, you know, persona exercises. Perhaps you use personas um, for your marketing or communications materials to try to better understand what people like, what their interests are, and how you can craft communications. But when it comes to uh, engagement, uh, the contact model really says, what's the specific information 
that I am going to use on a regular basis to, to, further, uh, to further engage with specific contacts. So, you know, uh, personas often will say, you know, uh, might have demographic information, age range information, types of, uh, types of pop culture that audiences like, you know, pers personas go all over the map. But if you're not using the specific information about very specific groups uh, in your communications efforts or engagement efforts, the contact model helps to get you there. Um, and, and it really all comes down to meaningful engagement. And that is going to vary depending on the organization, the different parts of the organization, and who they care to engage with and how. Um, you know, so some organizations care mostly about fundraising, and that is a huge part of their outreach. So a lot of their interactions are going to be about fundraising. It's going to be different in an advocacy case or in a think tank model. So what it comes down to is really defining meaningful engagement and then making sure you have a clear picture of your audiences, what you know, who they are, what they care about, so that you can really engage with the right people at the right time uh, in the right ways. But why contact models? We'll, we'll see this slide again. Uh, so Zoolander, if you haven't seen it, um, hilarious movie uh, about male models uh, that get swept up in this conspiracy uh, that's as old as time where people have been um, brainwashing male models to become assassins. Uh, and this uh, conspiracy theorist uh, investigator explains this to Zoolander and you know, lays it out in detail. And then Zoolander goes, but, but why male models? Uh, he just doesn't get it. Uh, so we're gonna be talking about, but, but why contact models? Really digging into the, the importance of this. So the, the most fun, fundamental uh, reason that contact models uh, are important is that you need to know who you're dealing with. You want to you want to know as much as you can about the people that you are interacting with. Um, so you can be clear on what you're providing, what they need and how well you're you're engaging. And the way that, that I like to break this down in a contact model is in kind of three, three buckets. You want to know who they are, what they care about, and what they've done in terms of interactions with your organization. Um, and I find it's really helpful to break it down into these categories so that you can be you know, super clear about the types of information that you need to track again, to empower those meaningful engagements. So who they are is kind of basic information. You know, you, if you have an email list, hopefully you have emails in it. Uh, hopefully you have names. Um, you have hopefully the, you know, the organizations, uh, you know, that your contacts uh, are with, particularly important uh, in advocacy or think tank organizations, a person's role. These are the sort of fundamentals about, uh, about a, a given person. You also wanna know what they care about. So particularly with organizations that cover lots of different topics, you want to know which topics resonate with a particular audience member. Um, you know, if you have a, a lot of content uh, on a, a very wide range of topics, it's highly likely that your contacts will only care about a small sliver uh, of that contact. So you need to know what they care about. Um, regions is another example if you're doing work across multiple geographies. Uh, things like content preferences or communication needs, right? Does this person like PDFs versus not like PDFs? Do they come and do they, they watch videos on the site? Do they interact with you on social media? Um, what are their communication needs? Uh, so if you have kind of a more advanced uh, email uh, system, you know, can they subscribe to specific uh, emails uh, that, you know, that, that, that they want to receive? So this gets into really understanding what they care about. And what they've done really gets to that heart of meaningful engagement. So you want your contact model to anticipate and say, when a contact does one of these things, we want our system or systems of record to, to note that. Um, so that could be anything from signing up for an event, an attending event, um, having a, uh, a direct meeting with staff. Um, you know, a lot of times organizations are siloed from a development and fundraising standpoint and a programming standpoint so that if there's one person in the organization or, or a contact, maybe they've met with someone in development, but a program team or communications officer doesn't actually know that that one-on-one -on -one connection has happened. But if that's a, a vital 
engagement to your organization, that's the kind of thing that, that ideally would be tracked. So other examples are, are donating and signing a petition. And again, you know, what we like to do is get all of these on the same page so that you can kind of clearly say, okay, th this is the data that we care about. Let's start there. Let's start with the data that we care about. And then we can figure out where the data is being collected, how we can collect it more efficiently, what we can do with that data. Um, because then once you have a clear mental model, then it becomes kind of a process and a platform or a technology challenge. So again, why contact models? You need to know who you're dealing with. But, uh, but why contact models? So the second reason is that you want to have this information. Like once you sort of model it, you want to have this so that you can find and engage with specific audience members individually or specific groups throughout your evolving relationship. Um, so I want to bring up a, a use case. Um, so we'll talk about contact use cases a little bit further down. But essentially getting really specific about what you want to be able to do with audience members when what happens. So this is an example from a think tank organization that throws uh, or hosts a lot, a lot of events. Um, and their events are, you know, primarily aimed at decision makers, influencers, policy makers, you know, people who have a say in the policy process. So, you know, the most valuable interaction is not necessarily that they signed up for the event, but what happens at the event, how it furthers that relationship. So this is kind of a, a fairly complex use case, but it really gets into the, the specifics of why contact model uh, is important. So this is a use case that came up with, uh, with uh, one of our organizations we work with. So alert me. So all the things that are underlined in green are either actions or attributes uh, that you want your systems and processes to be able to do. So alert me when a new contact from the State Department, an organization, registers for an event on national security. So I'll break that down again. So you're basically saying, okay, lots of people are coming to events. Um, and, and yeah, it'll be great. If you show me a list of that we got 40 people in an event, fantastic. But what's most important is if there's someone that I don't know about that's, that is a new contact and they're from the State Department, a highly important organization in our uh, audience engagement um, you know, model and definition. If someone new from the State Department registers for an event on national security, on a specific topic, um, then alert me. I want to know so that I can notify the program lead so they can send a personal email and reach out. But even before the event starts and say, Hey, I saw that you signed up for the event. We're really excited um, to have you here, you know, and take the conversation from there. And this is, this is where it gets really into the specifics of your organization uh, and how you define that meaningful engagement. Um, because this is not the use case that, you know, someone who is primarily doing small dollar fundraising uh, cares about. Um, so it all, but it all comes down to being very specific about what uh, you want to do with information or what you want your systems to be able to do. Um, so another example of this would be, you know, if someone signs up for email from a topic page, from that national security page, then add them to the national security list or flag them in the system as, as being interested in national security so that they can get emails specifically about national security. So again, this is the why, this is the big why of, of having a contact model. You need to have that in place so you can empower these types of, of interactions. But why, but why contact models? Chances are, um, or ad hoc, scattered, distributed, or non-existent. Um, and, and this is why we really emphasize starting with the, the content, the contact model rather than a particular system. Um, because what we found with, with a lot of organizations, particularly in the mission driven space that have so many different organizational uh, units, you've got development that has its own kind of agenda, programming, communications, uh, et cetera, you know, field work, you probably have elements of a contact model all over the place. 
Um, you probably have elements of it in your email system or systems. <laughs> You'll see a lot of little parentheses with S and exclamation point. Um, because there are probably lots of duplicative systems that hold little, little pieces of the knowledge about your contacts. Uh, so you have an email system or systems that different parts of your organization are using. You may have a CRM or CRMs for different organizational units. Um, you know, the development team might have, uh, or fundraising team might have their own donor databases that are completely separate from say the email list that a communications team uses. They might have the same contacts but they, the systems don't talk to each other. Um, you might have elements of uh, a contact model in the personas that you created three years ago um, that you, uh, hopefully you're using those for, to sort of hone your, your messaging approaches and, and thinking through who those audiences are. Um, but those probably have some deep insights into you know, who, who you're talking, talking to and why. Uh, the, ne the next two are my favorite because this I think universally applies to, to organizations. Um, there's probably members of your team who have a good sense of who they're talking to and why and what they know about them. Um, it might not be documented anywhere, um, or it might be documented in their spreadsheets or their personal um, you know, way of organizing things. And we often find that or particularly larger organizations um, will have you know, one or two kind of monolithic systems for tracking things that aren't flexible enough to accommodate program level needs. And so those programs will create their own spreadsheets to have that flexibility and say, you know, we want to track these very specific things. Um, so your contact model is probably a, a little bit here, a little bit there. Um, what's important is taking that step back and saying, okay, let's talk about who we want to contact, why, and what we need to know about them to, to power those, those future engagements. Because um, oftentimes what needs to happen is there needs to be kind of a, a cross-organizational collaboration to really define, you know, who cares about what pieces of data around a contact. Um, and then organizational coordination about updating the systems and processes to make sure that that data is there in the first place. Um, going back to our example about you know, alerting, alerting someone when a new contact from a particular organization registers for an event on a topic, um, you know, that's only possible if there's a clear process in place that says these two systems, our, our email and our event system will talk to each other. And there's someone in programming who's able to say, give me an alert when these particular criteria happen. happen. But again, it all starts with that, with that clear model. Um, and I'll, I'll reiterate that you can post questions in chat. We'll have time uh, at the end for a for a Q and A session, um, and then after after the uh, the webinar, I'll also be holding office hours if anyone wants to stay on and kind of talk a little bit more in a small group about particular challenges that your organization is is facing, or if you need some guidance on on how to to take what we're talking about today and start applying it. So, where do I start? Or, but how? but how contact models? Um, again, we'll, we'll start at some very basic, uh, you know, frameworks and, and, and information that you need to think about collecting um, because there, there are kind of two ways to do this. So one would be to go and say, okay, I'm gonna look through my email system, my CRM, my spreadsheets, and I'm gonna tabulate all the data that we have and all the data sources, and I'm gonna cross compare that and, and see what's right and what's wrong. That's a necessary step to really understanding where data lives in your organization and what systems handle it. Um, but we find it's much easier if you start with articulating what you care to know. So we're going to start with, with an exercise, which is just listing attributes of your contacts. So I'll go through a, a couple different ways of thinking about this and some examples. Uh, but this is a time where I'd, I'd love for uh, for you to be an active participant in the webinar uh, and, and start, you know, you can just be writing these down on paper um, or typing them up, um, but thinking through the attributes of your contacts that you care about. Um, you know, put aside how it's collected or where it lives or, you know, is it an email? Is it in a spreadsheet? I don't care about that at this point. You just want to start listing the attributes that you care about. 
Again, thinking in those three buckets, who they are, what they care about, and, and what they've done. So I'll talk through a couple of different ways of approaching this, but if you have some, some ideas, um, if you wanna put them in chat, that would be great so I can share them with, uh, with a larger group and provide some commentary. Um, but again, this is something that you can kind of start doing now and continue doing after the webinar. So again, the who they are is the basic information, um, name, email, organization, role. Again, some of that might, might, may or may not matter to your organization. Um, what they care about is like the specific elements of your, of your mission. Um, what they've done is the types of engagement that they do with you. Um, and as you're thinking through that list, like just think of the ones that are most important to you from where you sit uh, in the organization, start there. So if you, if you handle events, then knowing if they registered for an event, if they attended an event, if they downloaded the PDF follow-up to the event, those are all interactions that you might care to know about um, because you're close to uh, you know, the events. Another way to think of this, if you get stuck or kind of wanna go further in thinking of the attributes of your contacts is not to forget your taxonomies. So taxonomy is something that we really stress uh, and emphasize at Parsons CKO, which is really the different ways that you organize your communications and engagement assets. Um, and assets in this case includes contacts. Um, how do you categorize what you do and you know, present that to the world and capture information around that? So if you, if you kind of hit a brick wall where you're not sure what particularly around like the things that people care about, you can look at your website IA your hashtags on social media, the different folders in your email that you use to, to organize particular groups. You know, if you're doing a lot of direct um, uh, engagement with your audiences uh, via email, then you probably have an organizational system where you think, okay, well, these audiences are like this. So I have a folder where I keep emails for audiences like that. That's a great example of where you already sort of have a little bit of a contact model in place. Um, your contacts and groups list and segments. Um, I think we had a question uh, in um, in the uh, in the form when people signed up for the event that was like basically how is this different from list segmentation? Uh, and it's it's very similar um, in that basically your segments are part of your contact model, right? Where they're basically you basically say these are types of contacts that I care about. Um, you know, marketing campaigns, internal internal reports. You know, any place where you're categorizing information or contacts is a place where you can, uh, you know, start to really dig into and, and unlock hopefully some good attributes of your contacts. And I'll, I'll uh, bring this slide back up um, for some starters. Again, these are fairly straightforward and basic. Um, and, you know, many of which are probably already being, um, you know, already being tracked or captured. Again, in <laughs> in one, one system or maybe in multiple systems. Uh, so I'll kind of pause here for, for just a minute uh, and see if we get anything in chat um, about you know, who they are, what they care about, what they've done. And you know, so if you have any particular uh, examples um, of attributes that you think should go in your contact model, uh, you feel free, please post them in the chat uh, and, and we'll discuss. So I'll pause just for a minute and see if we get any of those. Uh, and if not, we will move on to the next section. Also feel free to, to, to post in chat if you have any questions overall, if anything's unclear. Um, we do have a Q&A portion coming up in a little bit in those office hours after the webinar that I mentioned. Um, but if you have any questions now about what this means, please feel free to ask. Okay, I'm not seeing anything in chat, so I'm going to move on. Uh, but uh, feel free to post uh, throughout if you come up with something uh, and you know want to share it or have a question about where it would fall or whether you know you know whether something might be valuable or not. All right. So again, this is this is the first the first step is going through and identifying 
this, these basic attributes of your contacts that you care about. Um, and oftentimes what we found is doing that with yourself first, or maybe your small team that you're a part of, uh, or a big team, <laughs> um, whatever team you're a part of, you can start there to start building the list. Um, the contact model becomes more powerful as you bring more people in the organization into the fold and into the process. So maybe you're in communications and you say, these are the things that I care about, that we care about our contacts. And then you can take that to someone in fundraising or in development and say, you know, what do you care about? Are there additional things here that you care about? And there might be some that you say, we think you probably care about this and this and this, and it's something we already track in our email platform or on our website. Um, but you know, the more that you can you know, start from yourself or from your team and then bring other people into the organization, that's gonna make your contact model and its eventual implementation more powerful because it reflects more of the organization uh, and, and more of the different needs and perspectives that, that different uh, parts of the organization have. So did have a question about how would you classify the difference in what they've done? Is it important to make that distinction from the start? Um, I think you know, it's important to, uh, to say the, the what they've done is, is really discrete actions that they've taken with you as an organization. Um, so if we're talking about the example of an event, um, did they sign up for an event? There's lots of interactions around events that can be potentially tracked and could potentially be very useful. Um, I think in the first pass, you might not need to get into as much detail about sign up for an event, attend the event, download the PDF, ask a question during the event. Um, you know, there's lots of specific micro interactions that, that you can track. Um, but I think the, the first pass through is really like, what are the big things? Like, what do we want people to do? Right. If if you know if we want people that are policy influencers to like have a one on one relationship uh, with one of our policy leads, like we want that to happen, and everything else is kind of a stepping stone for for that type of interaction. If we want people to donate, again, that's a clear interaction. You know, there's sub interactions, right? You might have start a fundraiser. Um, or you know, step up from a, a one time donation to a recurring donation. Um, Again, those are all kind of more specific interactions. Um, in terms of where you start, um, you know, I obviously ideally with strategy or um, in a perfect world, everything would already be in place and you would have been tracking this throughout time. But you know, the, the world as we've all seen uh, is not perfect. So some of this information you'll have to dig and kind of pull together. Other pieces you'll say, okay, we we really need to know what topics people care about. So we're going to need to make some changes in our systems and our processes to make sure we have that information. Um, in terms of, I got another great question about incorporating affinity scores into the model. Um, the affinity, if you have kind of a, a affinity scores or engagement scores, ideally those are going to be based on some degree of strategy, audience specificity and interactions. Um, so if, you know, if a particular type, if you already have an affinity score, that's great. Um, what, and oftentimes affinity scores or engagement scores, those types of things are built on evaluations of these types of criteria. Um, so, you know, a, a kind of an advanced engagement model or engagement score for an organization could be, you know, if the contact is at a certain level with their role, like if they are at a manager level or director level um, within uh, one of our top 10 most valuable organizations, their score is going to be higher than someone that just comes to this website once a week and has signed up for email and gone to an event, right? So it really depends on, um, on the specific kind of interactions that you wanna have with specific types of audiences. Um, and uh, if, if you know, we can talk more about affinity scores and, and scoring um, during the Q&A as, well as, uh, as well as office hours, but there, there's lots of ways to incorporate it or use this to actually build up uh, an affinity score. Okay, so the next exercise that we'll go through is what I call contact use cases. And this is basically the, the example that I showed above, which is really getting concrete about what you're gonna do 
with what you know about your audiences. So you can say, right, the, the, the things that we can incorporate into our contact model are, are nearly infinite, right? You could say, uh, I wanna know, we could, we could collect what people's favorite ice creams are, right? Um, pistachio, me personally. Um, but are you gonna do anything with that? No, it's probably irrelevant. So we get to irrelevant to your, to your, to your particular needs. So the contact use cases are really about specifying um, particular interactions uh, that you want to enable with your audiences. So this is this is the this is the exercise. So I want to find blank, where blank is a specific group of audiences or a specific contact that meets certain attributes, so that I can blank. And that so that I can is what, what's the action that you're gonna do if you're able to pinpoint that contact or specific groups of contacts. So I already gave the example above uh, of, you know, I want to find, or I want to be notified when um, someone who is a new contact at a particular organization with a particular job level on a particular topic signs up for an event. Those are five criteria. I wanna find someone that meets these five criteria so that I can get a notification. A simpler example would be, you know, I want to find people who have signed up for email on a particular topic who have also attended an event. So I can put them into a kind of a particular engagement category and say, this person is highly engaged. And again, the highly engaged thing will depend on, on your organization. Um, which is a, a, another kind of exercise, we won't go through it here, but another useful exercise is to think about what does a highly engaged audience member look like from my perspective in the organization? So what does a high, who is a highly engaged member and what do they do? So a highly engaged policy influencer is someone who subscribes to our email list and comes to our events regularly and has a one-on-one -on -one phone conversation at least three times a month with one of our policy teams. Right, very clear, uh, trackable definition of an engaged audience member. So this is the this is the exercise. I want to find blank, and you've got a couple starter ideas here on the left of different attributes that you can be looking for. Uh, so again, I want to find people who have donated. Right, that's a fair like a, that's a sort of a one criteria thing. I want to find people who have donated, and maybe it's a little more specific. I want to find people who have donated once, so that I can try to convert them to a recurring donation. Right? Very common use case in, in fundraising. And the, the examples on the right are, again, kind of just the, the different uses that you have with that data. So that can be to empower sort of, uh, you know, mass emails or one-on-one -on -one emails, arranging meetings, um, starting a campaign. Sometimes you really want to get a sense of um, you know, what, what particular issues are resonating with your audiences, what types of events are resonating with your audiences. So you can use that data to, uh, you know, effectively uh, plan uh, engagement campaigns. Identifying retention risks and conducting analysis. This is something that's a, a little bit, uh, a little bit deeper, but super valuable. Like once you're tracking information, you can say, okay, I want to find people who, you know, if it's a membership-based organization, um, you know, and we've we, we've done research that says if they attend a certain amount of events, then you know they're more likely to um, new. And if they're below that threshold, like if they've only attended one event and we've hosted forty in the past year, we can say I want to find those people because they're a retention risk, and so they're going to go in, our, in a specific sort of engagement uh, path or campaign. Um, and that last piece really gets to the idea of a lot of this uh, being powered by automation. You know, if you have a clear sense of the data that you need and what you're gonna do with it, most systems can be built or engineered or enhanced or connected in such a way to do that work for you, right? So that's, you know, the simplest example would be, you know, creating a basic segment uh, in email or running a report, right? How many people, uh, you know, clicked through uh, the, our latest email um, or how many people have opened at least, you know, half of the, the last emails that we've sent. So I'll pause here for just a second um, so that you could think of, you know, one or two uh, use cases for yourself in the organization. 
Um, and you know, if people have examples that they want to put in the chat, great. Uh, if you have questions, uh, you can put those in chat as well. Um, again, this is the kind of thing where the more examples, the more use cases you create, the more details you're going to get. Um, the more you do this with yourself and your team, the greater clarity of of the, 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 the more the model will come uh, into focus. And as that model comes into focus, that's when, again, you can go to your counterparts uh, or your colleagues in other parts of the organization and say, these are the things that we care about tracking. What do you care about tracking? What do you want to be able to do? Um, and so that the system can serve multiple people within the organization and not just the system, the processes, right? Because with engagement architecture, it's about the people who pull the numbers, who run the reports, who go through the data and adjust tactics uh, and the processes that say, this is what we're doing and why and, and how we do it. Uh, and then the platforms, the, the technology, it's just an enabler. Um, so the more that you could bring people throughout your organization into this sort of foundational uh, definition, foundational definitional, a little, little bit of a mouthful there. The, the more you can bring people into that work, uh, the smoother the rest of the path will be. So I'll pause here for just a minute and see if there are any kind of questions specifically about uh, the, the use case uh, creation aspect of this, or if people have uh, any examples that they would like to throw into chat. I'll take a look at that for just a second. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions or contributions to chat. So I think we'll move on to the, the next uh, idea here. And again, we can definitely circle back to this during Q&A or during, uh, during office hours. All right, so ideally what you've done first is kind of created that basic list of, of attributes. Um, and you, know, you have a good sense of you know, what you care about uh, tracking with your, with your audiences. Then you've taken the next step and said, okay, we've created some contact use cases. So we, we really have a clear sense of, of how we're gonna use the contact model um, to, to deepen our engagement. Uh, and I see, uh, I see a uh, quote coming in here. Um, Interested in uh, the start a campaign use case to make some paid promotions on LinkedIn to target similar kinds of users with a particular persona, basically using this to guide content strategy. Yeah, Ryan, that's a that's a fantastic example. Um, and again, that's where there's a lot of different facets of that. Uh, and so the more that you're able to break down kind of the specific elements that are part of it, the, the clearer the picture will be uh, will become of what you need to do to track it. Um, so, you know, again, if you have personas in place, those are a great place to start to say, OK, we we know we assume and we or we and or we know particular things about a uh, particular group that we want to target more effectively. Um, but are we getting data back from our systems that helps us either confirm or challenge our assumptions about the audience? Um, so if you're if you're using LinkedIn again, that is both a uh, a communications uh, platform as well as a data source, right? So you can go into LinkedIn and do paid promotions and see how well uh, you know you're targeting against particular aspects of personas or contact models uh, are working. And then you get that, that feedback. Um, and you know, the great thing with, the, with, uh, with LinkedIn with um, paid promotions is that you're really able to get really specific about elements of this contact model. Uh, so you know, organizations, geographies, roles, you know, there, there's so, so many facets that you could really, really drill into. Uh, and, it, and it can be overwhelming. So again, the, you know, starting with, you know, what do we care about most? Um, another way of thinking through the use cases is, you know, if I could know one thing about an audience member uh, in order to get them to 
um, you know, join a coalition or donate? Like, what would be that one thing um, that I could use to either speak their language more clearly or, you know, modify my ask to be more relevant to them or provide them the perfect piece of content that, that we're going to, that we have? Um, uh, Ryan's question about guiding content strategy is great um, because you, <laughs> you know, if, if you're a mission-driven organization, probably you have a, a lot of content that you need to get out there. Um, you, you know, and you probably have rel a relatively small staff to, to support that content creation. So you want to know if it's working. Um, you want to know, you know, is it what your audience needs? So this is a great way with the contact model. Um, we talk about content preferences as one of those categories. Like, do people, you know, does your very specific audience, do they want a PDF? Do they want a one page PDF? Do they want a long web page? You know, there's a lot of assumptions and sort of general, um, uh, you know, data about how people interact with content, but that's not as useful as, as having much more specific uh, kind of context and data around your audiences. So great, great questions and thoughts there. Okay, so then once you've done uh, the use cases, you go back to that, to your evolving list of those contact attributes. And this is really becoming the starter for your contact model, um, is you know, all the, these three sort of sets of attributes. So hopefully if you go through and do a lot of those use cases, you might say, oh, we really care about you know, where someone is, you know, in, in you know, if you're a uh, uh, national nonprofit, you might go, oh, we actually care about where people are, but we're not tracking that anywhere, right? Um, then, you, then you can say, okay, we're going to add that, like the geography or location into that who they are bucket. Um, you know, maybe in exploring the use cases with different parts of your organization, you determine that someone, it, it really matters, um, you know, what a particular type of audience member is, is saying on social media. Um, and that's one of the, what they've done things, right? And, but it's not tracked anywhere or it's tracked in one sort of specific place that's siloed off and only, you know, analyzed once a quarter. So hopefully going through those use cases, come back to uh, this list of attributes and really continue to, articulate what are those aspects of your contacts that you care about. Okay, so the next, the, the big next step, um, I've kind of summarized in, in one slide here, um, because this is going to get, be where it gets really specific and, and kind of dependent on the different systems you have in place and what you're trying to do as an organization. Um, so this is the, the using the contact model. Um, so we talked a little bit, uh, or we, we walked through the, the basic elements of the contact model and how you can start getting those together. Um, I find spreadsheets are fantastic if you just want to start listing those elements. Um, what really, you know, where the rubber really uh, meets the road is when you can implement and operationalize it. Um, and those are two separate but related things, right? Because implementing means how do you actually get it in place? Um, how do you get your systems to collect the data that you want so that you can do things with it. Operationalize it means like, how are you going to continue doing that over time? Not just from a technical standpoint, um, you know, we have our system set up to collect the data, but how are you going to make sure that you are going to use the data? That, you know, someone who comes on board in your organization six months from now is going to know, oh, I need to use that data. That data is there and value, valuable to me. That's so when it gets really into the people and processes, uh, you know, part of the equation. How are you going to operationalize the contact model so that people know that it exists and that they can use it? Um, so these are a couple of, again, high level, high level next steps to do once you start to, to build out that contact model. Um, one is you determine where those contact attributes are stored, if anywhere or anywhere. Right. Again, some of this information might be an email and your CRM and spreadsheets and a donor database. Um, to get a clear picture, you wanna know where that information is. Um, and then you wanna identify and close gaps in storage or collection, right? So if, if you care, if you need to know what topics people care about, you need to collect that data somewhere. And you know, maybe that's best in your, EML, e, uh, in your email system and your CRM, you know, it's gonna depend on, on, on what you use. 
Um, the next step is creating technical requirements for meeting your use cases. Um, th this really boils down to, you know, what, what do our systems and processes need to do in order to, um, to meet our use cases? So if your use case is, I want to be alerted whenever a new contact from an organization signs up for an event on a topic, all of those elements of that use case need to be empowered by your system. Right, so your system needs to be able to know when someone signs up in a, for an event, are they a new contact or if not a new contact, right? Um, if someone signs up for an event, is there a form or an element of the form for organization? So we can say, oh, this person is from the organization. Um, chances are your, your system can do some of those things, maybe can't do some of those things, but you need to sort of spell out what those are. Um, there are probably some use cases that your current platform might be able to handle. Um, in which case, great, get started, right? <laughs> start tracking some of that information, start collecting some of that information. Um, you know, you will also probably run into to roadblocks uh, with what you want to implement based on how, you know, what your current system is or configured. And that's where you get more into the technical um, systems and uh, platforms piece of it, which would be, okay, well, maybe we knew, you know, are you, we have these 10 use cases, only two of which can be met by what we currently have. So we need to explore alternatives. So, the, so that's kind of the, the technical, the start of the technical path there. Um, then the, the final piece, and I, I don't even wanna say final cause it's kind of, it uh, supports everything in the, in the process for doing this really, which is showing off the contact model uh, and celebrating uh, what it enables. So, you know, oftentimes when you're trying to do something in an organization that it involves sort of systematic change or change that that, uh, that impacts the whole organization. Uh, change is hard, right? We all know this. And managing that change is hard. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, the more that you're able to start bringing people from other uh, parts of the organization into the contact model definition and those use case definitions, you can start creating champions who say, oh, we used to have three spreadsheets in our CRM, but now because we identified that before I meet a new contact, I want to know when they last donated, what topics they care about, and if they've gone to an event, I can run that report. And now when I talk to a contact, I save 15 minutes for every contact I talk to uh, in order to, before I have a one-on-one -on -one phone call with them, right? Things that are kind of driving uh, meaningful engagement that are freeing up resource time um, that are enabling people to do the work that they, that they're passionate about and care about, um, you know, and saying that, this, it, that it comes back to the contact model, uh, is, is really important. So that's again, high level next steps. Um, but that, that should put you on the path. Um, so I think we have, let's see here. Um, yes. So we have, we're at the, the, the Q and A session. Um, I see a, um, a question come in that I'll get to in just a second. So yeah, now's a great time to start throwing questions in the chat. Uh, and again, um, we have a few more minutes left for the webinar um, uh, quote proper, uh, but then we'll have uh, office hours. Um, I'll have a breakout room that people can, can jump in and, and we can talk uh, sort of more in depth, but presentation, okay. Um, could you speak to how we might go about setting up alerts for behavior across a segment of our audience? For example, a transatlantic think tank has a phenomenon with a high number of folks with Korean government email addresses reading our newsletter. How would we set up alerts so that we could identify and interpret behavior across unexpected cohorts? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So um, the, the process of setting up the alerts itself is gonna vary based on based on your platform. So I won't get too much into the, the, the technical pieces of that. Um, the way that I would break this down is really going back to that attributes list and looking for interesting intersections. Um, also, as you're going through that process of building out attributes, go back to your, your reports and your systems that you currently use and, and, and look for those things that say, oh, wow, we've got a lot of Korean email addresses. Maybe we wanna bake into our system. If someone comes from this email address extension, flag them, right? Or, or, or note that in some way. 
And maybe you don't even have to flag them because your system can can run searches or reports based on um, the the email email extension. Um, but uh, it, again, that that part's going to sort of depend on on platform. Um, so that yeah, so you're able to say. Um, okay, so we have we have lots of people with Korean um, government email addresses reading our newsletter. Great. Um, then you can drill in hopefully in your email tool or in your CRM and say, okay, the people who are coming from those addresses, what do we want them to do next? Right? Like, are they in a particular audience group where we care to have one on one conversations with them? Great. Now we know that they're reading our emails. Um, that and that gives us more information about how engaged they are. Um, you can you can set up alerts, and this gets into the affinity scoring or engagement scoring or any type of scoring, where if you're if you're clear about those types of engagements that matter uh, to you that you can track, you can set up alerts based on that. Um, so instead of instead of saying like every month we're going to go into the system and look for people uh, with Korean email addresses, um, you can set you know, set up your system to automatically run a report. You could set it up to to give you an alert if someone comes through with that and is not in your system uh, previous. Um, and then with the with the scoring piece, um, you know most sort of advanced, modern, capable uh, CRMs or email uh, systems will let you define your own engagement store criteria. Um, so you can say a combination of, um, of different types of action attributes and those sort of identity attributes that we talked about. You can say, you know, in our organization, we, or in our, in our program, we care the most about Korean government officials and how they're engaging with us. And if they say that they're with a particular, you know, if they have a role, right? Like, let's say you also wanted to know, is this a junior official, a senior official, um, you know, what part of the government they're in? If you can get that information as well, then you can say, okay, I'm going to assign a point value. If someone has a Korean, you know, uh, a government email extension, they're going to get two points. And if they are at this type of role or above, they're going to get another three points. For every you know, email they read, they're gonna get a point. For every event they attend, they're gonna get five points. Then you can set up your system to say, okay, show me the, the most engaged Korean government officials, right? Um, and then you can get a, a, a list that's, again, a more actionable segment or a, a subsection of, of all of your contacts. Uh, and again, what you do with that is, is gonna be defined by your use cases. Because maybe you wanna to do, um, what Ryan talked about in terms of guiding the content strategy, you might want to look at that list and say, okay, we know that these people have signed up for emails. Are they opening the emails? If they're opening the emails, what are they actually reading? Right? Are they, you know, a, a lot of organizations will have really long emails, um, but when you do an analysis, you might find that people only click the top thing, right? So you can do an analysis of their content preferences. So you can say, hey, to most effectively reach this particular audience, we know they're only reading the top thing of the email. So maybe let's send an e one email more frequently with one thing rather than 30 things that they're not going to read. Again, it's really just going to uh, um, uh, depend on depend on those use cases. Um, but again, yeah, kind of back to <laughs> back to basis and basics in terms of the um, the contact attributes, getting those down that you know about looking for interesting connections, and then looking at your systems that you're familiar with. Go into your email system and, and see, oh, we, oh, like notice trends, like, oh, there's a lot of, um, you know, Korean email addresses. Write that down, right, as a potential thing to, to, to look at. It's, if it's already in your system, that's great, right, because then you can start to use it. Um, hope, that, hope that answered the question. Um, we are pretty much at time. Um, we're at 12.58. So thank you so much uh, for joining us. Um, we will be sending um, sending out a recording of, of this presentation along with the deck. Um, if, uh, if you'd like to continue the conversation, as I said before, we'll have um, office hours uh, for a little bit after this if anyone wants to talk one-on-one uh, you know, -on -one or in a small group with me. Um, or you could reach out to me on LinkedIn. 
um, or uh, get in touch with, with Parsons TKO. Um, we have a lot of great community events like these webinars um, that uh, you know, are, are really uh, aim to, to, to lift up the nonprofit's ability to, uh, nonprofit sector's ability to engage with their audiences. So check out those events. Um, if you want to go ahead and you know, start a project with us, if you need some help getting a contact model off the ground, let us know. Um, we also have a survey. Let us know how you like the webinar. Um, otherwise, uh, thank you so much for spending uh, some time with us to learn about contact models. I hope this was useful uh, in your journey. And uh, yes, take, take care and or stick around. <laughs>